Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to this latest in our series of inaugural lectures at York St John. I'm Richard Bourne, I'm Pro Vice Chancellor of Education here and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture by Professor Robert Edgar. Rob was born in Doncaster and went to the University of Hull studying humanities. His PhD was on the character of Schlemiel in contemporary literature and film and while studying that PhD, he taught literature and film at Humberside University, now the University of Lincoln, and at the Open University. He came to York St. John in 1997 to teach on the film, television, literature, and theatre studies programmes. He served as a head of programme for theatre and film, and in his lecture tonight, he'll give you some brief glimpses of the range of surprising experiences that can come along with a role like head of programme. He once te tells me he once, for example, spent six weeks of the summer in a dustbin. <laughs> so Rob joined the creative writing team in 2014 to deliver modules on screenwriting. And in that team, he has worked with other brilliant colleagues to make creative writing what it is today, playing what he describes as a small part in the creation of the brilliant York Centre for Writing under the leadership of Professor Abby Curtis, he wrote and validated the MA publishing programme in 2020. He was asked to join the York Research Unit for Satire by Dr Adam Smith and Dr Joe War, and has helped with the Terra 2 programme uh, and project uh, led by Dr Liesl King. He co-developed the Music and Memoir Research Group with Dr Fraser Mann and Dr Helen Pleasance, and the Hauntology and Spectrality Research Group. His collaborative approach shines through in publications on screenwriting, music documentary, arena concerts and music venues, adaptations, folk horror, horrifying children, and much, much more besides. Rob has also served as the elected staff governor from 2015 to 2021, became an associate professor in 2018, and was promoted last year to professor. That's just some highlights of an extensive CV, you might imagine. He will be speaking with us tonight about the persistence of time, collaborations in cultural research and creative practice. So join me in welcoming Rob. Thank you, Richard. Very kind words, and uh, it does mean a lot. I did also ask for um, Tina Turner's Simply the Best to be played really loudly and confetti cannons to launch themselves from the front of the stage, but apparently it was too expensive. And that is the real effect of 30 years of neoliberal higher education funding policies. <laughs> but I don't want to be uh, too political uh, just yet. Um, some 18 years, I think, or so ago, things were quite difficult in the department I was in and in higher education uh, generally at that time. And some of us who were around at that point refer to them as, as the dark days. Um, and at that point, my colleague Andy, Andy Platz is here, found in the boot of his car a very elderly sandwich, really elderly. And despite the fact it was in its plastic wrapper still, it had gone a little bit green, curling up at the edges. And he went to throw it away when we stopped and put it in a filing cabinet, thinking, if things got really bad, we'd all have a bite, be off for six weeks, and whatever was going wrong would have blown over after that time. <laughs> Earlier today, I wish we still had that sandwich, and it may be on campus uh, somewhere. I think everybody I've spoken to who's done one of these inaugural lectures has said it's absolutely uh, terrifying. And it wasn't trying to think of something to say. I've made a very good living about banging on a book about books and films for, for years. I think the fear is that I might be found out. And it's this. <laughs> Something I, and I know many others, suffer with terribly. Um, and I think, in part, this relates to one of the things I want to talk about today, which is about collaboration and the drive to collaboration, partly about support, but I'll come on to that in part two of this session. And there's a lot of really interesting research around about uh, how imposter syndrome manifests itself in, itself in academics in terms of nerves, in terms of you know, concern about how you're dressed. I've managed to get over that one, as you can see. 
But also, when I, when I was reading around it, I was struck with one line in particular. I never intended to be an academic. And I think that's really, uh, really significant. I mean, I often joke about it that when people ask, how did you end up working in a university, that I stood in the wrong queue at the job centre. And it's not quite, sadly, that simple. The idea of going to university was always really important uh, to me. And very interestingly, many of my friends' uh, school, it was an ordinary comprehensive school in Doncaster, loads of my friends ended up at, at university all around the country. Indeed, one here somewhere, Warren, uh, in design, who I went to school with as well. So lots of us who ended up in higher education. But it was the idea of it that was important to me. And partly, it's because I wanted to be an indie star. I wanted to be a rock star. <laughs> It was slightly spoilt by having uh, absolutely uh, no talent uh, whatsoever, which was a bit of a problem. But I thought, like many people before me, I'd go to university and become famous. Uh, it may happen yet. And of course, you'll recognize all these indie stars from the early 90s. Anyone? <laughs> Not you, Amy. You'll know. Anyone? No? Right. There'll be a quiz at the end of this. Nobody gets out until you name not only the artists, but the songs. But we'll come back to some of them. They are the greats, the wedding present, Ned's Atomic Dustbin, the Happy Mondays, Ultra Vivid Scene featuring Kim Deal. Yeah? No? <laughs> this is what I should have been talking about. And of course, in the corner there, the House of Love and Cud. We mentioned some of these people again in a moment. But it was always also in narratives, stories about higher education that drew me to it in part. Um, I could name many, many texts which talk about higher education, but this, I think, was the one that grabbed me the most. Andrew Davis's A Very Peculiar Practice, which featured as a riff and a refrain through this strange new university, two nuns who were wandering around the bins <laughs> at the back of lecture halls all the way through. This never commented on, never discussed, never debated, but were always there. When I came to York St John University for an interview in a hot July day in 1997, in a very ill-fitting suit, um, I didn't realise quite the theological connections of the institution, and there was a theological uh, conference happening at that point. And as I walked onto the campus by what was then called the Crush Bar, now the dining hall, with two nuns stood by the bin smoking. <laughs> this was the place for me. I, I think it was, it was fate, really, that brought me here and made me stay. But this is, this is the house I, I grew up in. This is where my mum and dad lived and still live. And I think, again, one thing listening to people talking at these events that, that's common and is shared is the support of family and of parents. I was first in family to go to university. Uh, my brother, second in family, uh, he got a PhD as well in maths and science and something. I don't know what he does, really. I asked him, and he claims he doesn't know either, um, but he does something uh, in, with computers. Um, but both of us went to university with the support of my parents. So that encouragement uh, was really significant. And I mentioned my parents have always lived there and they're both custodians, if you like, of a personal archive that I have. They've become archivists. Their attic is forever Christmas in 1997 to about 1992, uh, 1982. Never throwing away anything away is perhaps an important skill for a creative writer and for an academic, but probably should be more of a metaphor than something literal. Art, attic artefacts are significant. Here's just a small sample of things that I pulled out the attic recently and had a look at. There's a lot more up there. But some of these items take on that's only a few days ago when I was there at the weekend. It's still like that. I've got a video. I was going to put it on a slide, but it, my parents wouldn't forgive me for it. It's, it's all my, I'm sorry. It's all my clutter. <laughs> but it's how these things that I found take on a different character with time that I found particularly interesting. 
For example, the Rolf Harris magic brushes. I dread to think where the red brush has gone. <laughs> and the thing that took my attention more than anything else is there, the top left of the screen. And it made me, seeing that, those legs poking out the box above the Action Man tank, led me to change the title of this session from The Persistence of Time. I wrote that months ago. I had no idea what it meant then <laughs> and didn't now. So it gave me a good idea. The Wicker Dog. So that's what this is called. This dog had no name. It sat on top of a bookcase in my bedroom right the way through my childhood. When I left to go to university, along with all the other stuff, the archive, it's not stuff, it's my archive, made it into the attic and was there ever since. And it's only recently going up there and seeing the dog again made me really realise something about it. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So part one of this, that was just the introduction, part one of this is hauntings. And I just want to talk about the idea of, of hauntings and a little bit of research that we've done around hauntings and, and memory. Also in my parents' house is a, uh, a record cabinet, a really big one. It's got loads of my, my records in them. I think young folks call them vinyl. But they're all there still. And a TV had kind of got moved in front of it, so it's not something we opened very often when I went back. So contained in there were my, my memories sort of, what I thought of of myself. And I imagined that it would be full of Dinosaur Junior 10-inch records. And I was kind of right. There's a Sonic Youth there. Surprise me, a white uh, vinyl copy of Beastie Boys' Frozen Metalhead. Didn't know I had that. It's great. It's worth a few quid, too. Not that I'm selling it, parents, I'm not. Um, unless anyone wants to offer. Um, uh, could Haywire, again, more Ned's Atomic Dustbin. And it was great, this idea, this picture I had of myself in the past was there, complete, until I found all the prog rock, the Marillion, <laughs> the Jethro Tull. Now, I love those bands now, but it wasn't what I pictured of myself in the past. I was someone else. And it led me, analytically, into something which we've been toying with a little. Hauntology as... Uh, a kind of critical area of study. So I want to kind of mention this as a framing device for some of the research that we've been doing. Hauntology is a slippery term. It can mean various different things, but this is, I think, a great definition of it, the, the great Mark Fisher. It doesn't feel as if the 21st century has started yet. We remain trapped in the 20th century. In 1981, the 1960s seem much further away than they do today. Cultural time has folded back on itself and the impression of linear development has given way to a strange simultaneity, if I could say it. The ghost here is a spectre understood not as anything supernatural, but that which acts without physically existing. It's a really neat summary, this kind of presence of the past and a timeless, this collapse of time being central. And it, obviously, you can see how the attic led me to that. It prompts a thought, though, because it's very easy to be nostalgic about those items, those objects, and there is a level of nostalgia there. And I think this is a really good example of, of nostalgia. One or two people in the room will remember it. That's not the Windsor's World of Shoes that I'm referring to. I cannot find a, a photograph of the, of the Windsor's World of Shoes that existed. There are a few nods here. Um, before, no, never mind this building, before... In, in, a long time ago, when Ripon, this is like, it is like a fairy story, when Ripon was still open and just closed and everything was moving onto this campus, we had to extend. Before this building was built and before the Fountains uh, Learning Centre was built, there was on the corner a Windsor's World of Shoes and the university bought that land to expand to what, partly to what we are uh, today as we became York St John um, University. But while the planning permission was going through to build the new building, we used it as a lecture theatre. Few of us do remember that. Um, some desks had gone in there and a projector, but nothing else had changed. There were still racks of shoes at the back. <laughs> and occasionally, as you were chatting away to a room full of students, 
You'd see a face pressed up against the glass doors, somebody with a couple of shoes in a carrier bag trying to return them. <laughs> it's this kind of odd, rosy glow of the past, of the dark times, that we see, perhaps, as a, a, a moment of distinction between nostalgia and hauntology, how we remember things as dark as they may be with some kind of fondness. Now, it wasn't particularly dark, although it was quite uncomfortable on occasion. Um, working on another project at the moment with my colleague, Wayne Johnson from Media, the Routledge Companion to Folk Horror, which we've, <laughs> we've just sent the manuscript in again for. And as part of that, one of the leaders of the folk horror revival movement, who isn't an academic but publishes his work in a lot of academic sources, wrote this for us about pop hauntology. Pop hauntology stems from the melancholic memory of growing up in often quite trying but oft fondly remembered days, as well as the additional memories of an anticipated future that never came to pass. Uh, our tomorrow's world daydreams might be summed up by the word anamoya, nostalgia for a time you've never known. It's actually a deliberately made up word, but indeed all words are made up. With this we know its origin is within the dictionary of obscure sorrows, as it defines an actual feeling, one all too common to many children of the haunted generation. And the haunted generation is a concept, again, which emerged as a lot of this critical thinking does in popular forms. The Haunted Generation is, was defined by the journalist uh, writer Bob Fisher, who I'll return to in a moment, and that's Bob's image of the 1970s primary school up there. This thinking has led us, in terms of our research, to, to this, and out soon. I should have brought a box of them to sell, shouldn't I? <laughs> Available in all good books. It's, no, I can't get copies yet. It's nearly out. Um, uh, Thomas Hardy and the Folk uh, Horror Tradition, where we investigated, and uh, my colleagues Alan and, and John and I worked uh, on this, this project. What we, struck us uh, was that some of the early work, or some of the work of, of Hardy, and his evocation of Wessex, the, early, the, the kind of socio-political scene in the early 19th century in Dorset, there were odd and strange parallels between that and the 20th century in northern Britain. And partly it's the idea of the darkness that sits behind memory and a particular kind of memory that's rooted in uh, childhood. The book was authored by the three of us. I can't remember who wrote this particular paragraph. It sounds very good, so I'll take credit. <laughs> when the folk return, it is first as parody with television such as the League of Gentlemen. What resurrects their malevolence is the post-banking sector crisis and with it a collapse in the belief in neoliberal social progression. The rise of the right and other forms of extremism evokes the 1970s. The rise of a second wave of folk horror can be mapped against the rise of political parties who conjure a view of the past as nostalgia. As with Hardy, writers, filmmakers and artists today know that this view of the past hides a dark reality. Britain is increasingly haunted by its past, and this can be seen politically in the evocation of a history of the Second World War, which is now too distant to touch and is therefore easily weaponised. Folk horror takes us to a different past, one of memories of childhood. This is a haunting, a past within living memory. The effect of this is to establish contemporary folk tales as they are forged in the mind of the young and exist in the memory of the adult. But with contemporary society, one of the things, again, we've identified across the range of different projects that we've been engaged in, uh, and it's coming forward in, again, working with my colleague Lauren and John on the Horrifying Children book that we've talked about, is this relationship between the collective and the individual, something that's very particular about the modern world. Again, from the Routledge Companion to Folk Horror, this was an interview, or part of an interview I conducted with Bob Fisher, which has formed a, part, uh, a chapter in the book. The idea of tracks of our collective childhoods being lost is one I find hugely affecting. Important things from our childhood now only exist in our heads. So the idea of things disappearing. I think the melancholy of lost things is crucial to the feeling. 
And Bob talks about it in that idea, this feeling, this slightly indefinable sense of unease that we have. It's even there in Bagpus. Emily finds ancient, um, I can't see it, Etheria, that other people have lost, and she brings these weird knickknacks to Bagpus in his shop, where strange rustic stories are weaved around them. There is something intrinsically melancholy about that. And even as a four-year-old, I knew that there was something very sad about a child's toy finding its way into this strange, wood-panelled Edwardian room. So Bagpus is almost a manifestation of the specific sense of loss I'm talking about. Those bits of our childhood or past that we cannot get back, no matter how hard we try. This idea of melancholy and the past haunting us I think, is particularly significant. In trying to title the chapter and in discussion with Bob, I referred to it as analogue memories because that's essentially what he was talking about. And this idea of analogue, I think, is, uh, is important. The difference in aesthetic, the difference in form, the look of static, all of those things have disappeared. They're long gone or reproduced. And what we're left with are traces of those things. That's Tim, who I used to work with, Andy, who was a postgraduate student, and me as Nag in Endgame. Six weeks in a bin in the middle of a stage. That's what it was, <laughs> the answer. This idea of the collective and individual, the mechanical, the digital, and its relationship to memory is also something that uh, Fraser, Helen and I uh, discussed in what was, uh, I think, the first piece of work of its kind, Music Memory and Memoir, which discussed the, the, kind of, uh, the amount of music memoirs that are being produced at the moment. Huge volume. Again, a lot of them from indie and punk, star, uh, punk rock stars, the kind of people I was looking at and inspired me to go to university. The connection runs through. And this is something I talked about in the opening chapter to that book, uh, which I, I titled, I think, Hiatus and Liminal uh, Authenticity. The nature of our memories, as defined by popular culture, might easily be seen as trivial. trivial. The alignment with a popular cultural or commodified form could easily drive this perception. The eclectic mixing of the artefacts of individual memory compounds the authentic function of the event. In this case, in this book, we were talking about the musical event. You go along and see a pop band and it takes on a particular status. In the context of this, it could be any event in our lives. However, these events of authentic, uh, levels of authentic expression are problematized when shared and the artefacts of memory, which in popular cultural terms specifically, are always forever shared. There's always been a play between the commodified and the personal. And that refers back to some of those artefacts that I found, some of those things that we talked about, their toys that everybody bought, their television programmes that everybody watched. And they're very personal to us. And at the same time, everyone has also engaged with them. And there is a melancholy to that as well. And with the containing of the analogue on digital formats, uh, and more and more of our lives being captured and reproduced, time yeah. folds in on itself. Okay. Part two, <laughs> collaborations, moving on from that. I've, I really want to use this as my staff photo on the web page. <laughs> I'm told it's inappropriate. Uh, I can't see why. I keep having my photograph taken by a university photographer who is very, very good normally. I said, when I have my photograph taken, she keeps sending me back photos of a slightly portly middle-aged man, and I don't understand why. <clears throat> I'll send a letter. So just a few thoughts about collaboration. It's one of the things that I've enjoyed most in my time in higher education. That made it sound very final. That I continue <laughs> to enjoy in my time in education. 
collaboration is, is really important. And the first thing, I suppose, just to draw out, and this is just a few sort of random thoughts about it, is the idea of, of, of teaching as a collaborative practice. Uh, and as this quote, very, very good quote, I think about the nature of collaboration in higher education, suggests, comes in many guises, teacher, collaborative, collaboration in the classroom, peer teaching, etc., <coughs> collaborative learning. And I think it's partly the relationship, not just between peers teaching, but between student and staff uh, as a collaborative practice that's so uh, important. And that's made its way to uh, a, a number of, of books and other projects that, that we've worked on. This one, for example, Adaptation for Screenwriters, uh, what I worked on with, with John uh, and Alan, has a, 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 a script in there as well. But this material developed out of and in relation to uh, what we were working with students. So it's material which we know worked with and for students. It came out of a dialogue with, with students. And that extended across uh, another uh, set of work that we did. The language of film, uh, self John and Steve, screenwriting and directing uh, fiction, which I did on my own, that one. That wasn't collaborative. In fact, at the start of this, I was tempted to come out with that line that Spike Milligan used when he got the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, for comedy, where he walked out on stage and said, I don't want to thank anyone, because I did it all on my own. <laughs> really undermined the collaboration bit, but I didn't think that was perhaps appropriate. But what I, uh, I was most uh, struck with in this particular quote was the sentence which reads, whatever its particular form, collaboration involves deciding goals together with others, sharing responsibilities, and working together to achieve more that, that could be achieved by an individual on their own. And actually, I think some of that does go back to that opening statement about imposter syndrome. There's no such thing as altruism, perhaps. It's hugely uh, comforting. It gives one security in ideas to work collaboratively with other people as well as improving those ideas and benefiting all the people concerned. It's a really important thing, apart from with that last book, which is the best one. <laughs> I was also very fortunate to um, receive what I think was some informal mentorship, although I didn't recognise it at the time, and I don't think it was necessarily delivered in quite that way. We'd worked on these books, which are well-researched, beautifully written, fantastically illustrated, and a bargain price, <laughs> but also were, were very textbook-focused. They were the things that I was most familiar with at that point. These were written as I was at the point of sort of coming out of film and TV and moving into creative writing. But I hadn't run or worked on a large, larger kind of research project with an output. And I worked with my colleague Ben. Some people remember Ben. Ben used to work here a very long time ago. It's now director of the Doctoral College at uh, Wolverhampton, after being at a couple of other places. Uh, ben was very, very generous with his time and with his support, with his ideas. And what was really useful about him was an inspiration, was about how to construct something like this, how to lead a research project particularly, and how collaboration worked at that level. Again, as we know, there are different models of collaboration. Not all of them are flat collaboration. We can have hierarchical collaboration. And that's what Ben was employing there, very deftly and very subtly and very supportively. This is how you do it. I'll show you how you do it now. Off you go, and you can do it yourself. And it was sort of recognition of that uh, after the event. And you know, we, we did a lot of, particularly around the arena concert, a lot of... Um, conference papers which related to this, and that research mentorship continued through that. And into research uh, collaborations uh, here, building on those, things which I mentioned already. Um, the Music Memory and Memoir uh, book, edited by myself, Fraser, and uh, Helen was the first book uh, that we did on this particular project. As I mentioned, looking at the nature of mu contemporary music memoirs, but much more than that. It was starting to collate and collect um, memories from people. So it includes musicians, it includes fans, uh, a whole range of different people. So collaborative is this book that the ident for it and the image, rather beautiful image, 
of Kristin Hirsch's uh, Telecaster. Uh, the Crescent Community Venue in York was taken by my partner, Julia. Um, it's a real, real family uh, endeavour. And led into uh, a conference, You're Twisting My Memory Man, uh, in 2019, uh, which uh, Amy, who's a PhD student uh, with Fraser and I, uh, um, interviewed um, Lucy O'Brien at, amongst other things. There's no such thing as altruism. I managed to get to speak at the conference. Tom Hingley from the Inspiral Carpets. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, Will and Carl from Cud. Thank you. That's very good. They were fantastic. Uh, and Julianne Regan from All About Eve, who contacted us. I was amazed. I was astounded. It was on Twitter. We got a Twitter thread, uh, which Fraser and I had access to. And he, he was merciless in what he said to me, because it was quite pathetic. I was like, oh, Juliana saw you play at Crystal Pole Dope in 1990, supporting The Cure. You were great. It was so pathetic. <laughs> but so impressive. But we've continued that work into venue storage, which features some of those people and even more people uh, that we, we wanted to work with. And very pleasingly, a whole range of fans and uh, I think four people from York St. Four postgrad students from York St. John who are working on that. And it's led into this collaborative research group uh, around music memoirs uh, with the three of us with Amy, with Chris, uh, and with Cynthia now, who are all working on similar subjects uh, related to, to the kind of core principles of it. And hopefully from today, working with Brendan in the business school on a, a, an extension of the York Music uh, Stories project that we set up as well. None of that would have been possible without all those people being involved. And the York Music Stories project wouldn't have worked without Amy being a research assistant on that as well. So it's a collaborative effort. As Richard mentioned, I've also been uh, very lucky to have been invited to work on other people's projects. And there are so many of them. I just drew out a few uh, here, working with Chris uh, and Joanna on a, a project about the First World War. At the bar convent, that photo, uh, I contributed something to an, to an event at Abbey with your pollination project, it's absolutely fabulous. Lethal to the Terra 2 project, the ongoing Terra 2 project, which is absolutely fantastic. And to Joe and Adam uh, and Claire for the York uh, Search Unit for Satire as well. It's a real honour to be invited to do those, uh, those things. Oh, nearly done. I just wanted to say a little bit, though, about collaboration and collaborative practice in creative writing, something I've been involved in uh, right since, I suppose, going to university in different ways. Collaboration is, is something we teach students, it's something which is central to uh, creative writing. Interestingly, and I think importantly, because it can be seen and is too often seen as a solitary activity, and there are moments, we know, of solitary uh, practice. But it's, collaboration is absolutely central. At one level, of course, it's industrial, for want of a better term. Writers work with editors, agents, and publishers. Um, we saw a lot of that only a couple of days ago with a, an industry day that happened in this space. Um, under Helen's leadership. That was a fantastic day where students got to collaborate with editors, agents, and publishers. So that's one aspect of collaboration. The other act of collaboration, I think, is about sharing of ideas, which is so crucial, people being open to sharing ideas with each other, which requires nerve and some level, often, of bravery to put your ideas out to other people. But again, without that moment of collaboration, those ideas wouldn't develop. They wouldn't extend. One of the other things which I also think is a rather unusual and often forgotten form of collaboration is what we do as creative writers. And one of the reasons why it's so important in the academy is it requires research and it requires us to transport ourselves to other places, 
to other people's viewpoints inside other people's psyches and to understand their, their mindset, their view, in very, very different ways. That too, I think, is an important moment of collaboration. It is, as Margaret Atwood perhaps really eloquently puts it, it's about negotiating with the dead. And as Hilary Mantel, her, one, of, one of the memoirs is uh, titled, Giving Up the Ghost. So perhaps what we're doing with these forms in some ways or another is facing spectres of one form or another. And perhaps the importance of sharing our thoughts verbally and in writing is so we don't have to share, uh, face those spectres uh, alone. These are, as I mentioned, some of the projects that we're working on at the moment, soon to be released, I've mentioned that, Thomas Hardy in the Folk Horror Tradition. We had a hauntology conference not long ago, which was fabulous. Bottom image there is going to be the cover of the Routledge companion uh, to folk horror. Um, and just a, a brief note on that. We got the design back from, or the preliminary design from Routledge. And Chris, who we've been dealing with there, said, uh, we, we're going to have to crop it, so we're going to have to crop the figure out. Both Wayne and I said, what figure? And I took the photo and I said, what figure? And we zoomed in and there's a figure lurking in the corner. We said, do whatever you want with the cover. You've got to keep that figure in. That's really weird. And the cover of the horrifying children book, we haven't got the design yet, is the photo in the middle. That's the attic. Everything comes full circle. That's my mother's. Um, I think it's a doll. Who knows? <laughs> so it takes us full circle back to, back to folk horror, back to hauntings. Uh, and um, to the Wicker Man, foundation, probably the, the, the uh, text for, for uh, folk horror. Long time ago, 1997, I arrived here. One of the first people I met was a guy called Bill Pinner. Bill was a, again, some people will remember him, a very wonderful man, very gruff man, rather wonderful. And he became head of what was then theatre, film and TV before I did. Um, one day I'd, I'd used in a bit of teaching an extract of The Wicker Man, because I really like it. Uh, and it had educational value, but primarily because I really liked it. I gave the game away then. That's, uh, that's how I decided on it. And I was talking to Bill about it. And Bill said, you know, my brother wrote the book that The Wicker Man's based on. I said, nonsense, Bill. Anthony Schaefer wrote the script, the screenplay. Everybody knows that. And this is before, 1997, before the, folk, the term folk horror had ever been used. It didn't really exist. It wasn't used until 2010, or wasn't formalised until 2010. So it's absolute nonsense. Bill was insistent about it. Subsequent research bears out that he was right. His brother wrote ritual that the Wicker Man's based on. Perhaps, again, I was fated to do this kind of research. And it brings me back, and again, is why I gave this session, retitled this session, as the Wicker Dog. There's something strange about that dog and you might not be able to see from there what it is. I don't know if you can spot it there. You get the idea. It's terrifying. It's made out of cigarette packets. This 50-year-old piece of folk art that sat in my bedroom for years and years is made out of players' number 10 packets. Not really terrifying, but quite unsettling. But don't worry if that makes you feel a little dirty. There's always something in the attic with which... <laughs> You can cleanse yourself. 
I did... Um, right, I'll stop in a sec. Um, I did... I was going to do an interactive thing. Don't worry, I won't. I'll stop it. <laughs> um, I haven't got time. Uh, I did start to put together a list of people who I had in some way uh, collaborated with during my time in higher education, both at this university, other universities, and outside. And I stopped at this point because there were too many people. You might see your name up there. Some things like validations, research projects, everything. This is all part of, 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 of the process of collaboration. But it is really an honour to, to be here. Uh, it, I, I can't express that clearly enough. To be amongst eminent professors, Green, Edwards, Yaffle. <laughs> but perhaps back to the persistence of time. A youth sat in an office in Wilmot building over in the corner of the campus. That was the first office I had. Shortly after that, I moved somebody, Anya Sharkey, who had the office down at the, the end. She moved out. It was a bigger office. I went straight in there. I was there for a while. Then moved to what was Long Corridor, Quad East, Quad South. And then eventually came back when I moved into creative writing up into Wilmot and realised I'd been all the way around the campus <laughs> and ended up exactly where I started. But it's a place I'm very, very uh, happy um, to be. So to conclude, uh, I guess, just thanks, I think, to, uh, to everyone, uh, especially to colleagues in uh, film and TV, uh, to Richard for a wonderful introduction, uh, and Marie, thanks for the wine. <laughs> It'll come in very handy. Uh, and especially to colleagues in creative writing who I've been working with most recently. You couldn't wish for uh, a better, more collaborative, more generous uh, group of colleagues. Uh, and especially uh, thanks to uh, Abby for giving me an academic home when I needed it. Thank you for that. Uh, and, and finally, special thanks to my partner, Julian, to my parents, uh, who have been the biggest source of support uh, and inspiration imaginable. So I'll stop. Thank you. One of the things that is always fabulous about uh, an inaugural lecture is that it's got that capacity to reinforce your impression of what a fantastic place York St John is, but also to surprise you as well. There's all sorts of stuff I was expecting in that lecture. <laughs> I was expecting it to be stimulating. It was. I was expecting it to be rigorous. It was. I was expecting it to be funny, and it definitely was that too. I wasn't expecting nuns, <laughs> shoe shops. I wasn't expecting Bagpuss and Iris Murdoch in the same lecture. I will now be forever haunted <laughs> by novelty soap. <laughs> but hopefully that has given people plenty to think about and to uh, come up with some questions. We've got about 10 minutes or so for questions. If you want to put your hands up, I'll, I'll come to various people. When I do uh, call you out and, and ask you to ask a question, can you just wait for the microphone to arrive before you do ask it, please? So who would like to go first? Amory. It's, it's, yeah, it's a really interesting area, and it's something that's, I think, only come out in the research recently, 
through um, discussion with one or two other colleagues. Uh, and again, I think it's something that started to come through Lauren. I know it's come through in the horrifying children work as well that, that we've been we've been looking uh, looking at. Um, it, it was interesting talking to, 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 to Bob about it and why, in discussion, we thought it was a relatively contemporary phenomena. And I think it's this idea that things aren't lost purely, but there's a potential to find them. Um, and that's why the, the archi archive has taken on not just a, a, a literal function, a literal archive, but there's the potential for things to be found, to be uncovered in an attic, you know, the tape reel to be found, the celluloid to be digitised, and suddenly the confirmation or not of these things which we experienced in the past to, to be there and to be present. And I think that's created a, a very odd sense of, of melancholy. I think that's part of it. But it's also something that... Mark, in particular, Mark Fisher uh, writes about, wrote about um, beautifully uh, about this collapse of the lost potential, lost futures. That there were thing, that things were supposed to progress in a particular way, and we were supposed to reach a particular point, not just socially or politically, but aesthetically. And those things never happened. So we find time kind of turning in on itself, and I think that's one of the things that that leads to a strange sense of melancholy. So I think this it isn't a binarism between something which is, is hauntological and something which is nostalgic. I think that's why Andy's idea of pop hauntology is a really interesting one and quite a unique one and why it's so good we've got it in the book. Um, it's really unique because he's talking about something where we move between these two positions quite fluidly. I don't know if that says. Thank you. Abby. That's a very good question. Um, I've been, like, like, an, like many people, I've not been writing a novel for a long time. Um, uh, that does contain objects, yeah. So there is something that, that they're not, it's not necessarily the artifact, but it, it, it's the child's toy that's central in it. So yeah, I think those objects do uh, have, a, have a lot of, of significance. And as some of you know, I've been, been pushing around, touting around a children's novel for a little while, which is still being read. Um, for those who don't know, and why would many of you, uh, the majority of the novel set in 1970s East Berlin. It's supposed to be for 12-year-olds. I don't know what I was, <laughs> what I was thinking. Um, but it's, uh, that, that has that presence as well. There's, there's a lot of objects from that, that era, a lot of objects which are, are out of time or seem strange to the central uh, character and they have to become familiar with. So I suppose in that sense, they do as well. There's a car chase and a Trabant in it. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite, yeah, I think it's quite good. <laughs> yeah, so no, I, 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 think, I think they do. And I, I'm not sure if it's just objects, but I think there are other things about the sense of melancholy, the sense of, of, of time collapsing back in on it itself that does feature as, as well in some ideas. So. Thank you. Keith. Hello, everyone. That's my fault, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's great. Um, I just have a question about the uh, work on sort of music and uh, particularly about sort of memory and music. And I'm always amazed um, about you, like your energy and your capacity to like, still gig. Good gig. Good gig. <laughs> Not gig, thank God. Good, good gigs. <laughs> Has, has, does the kind of your academic experience 
experience and knowledge and research can bleed into that experience as a fan. And does that alter it? Or, or can you only relate separate to? You know what I mean? You see what I mean? Is it, that's my question. Do the you know, two connect or can you divorce the two? Or, or are they or enhanced by that connection? It's, it's, that's, it's a really interesting question because I think again like a lot of us who studied literature or film or anything else the minute you finish a degree you never want to watch a film ever again <laughs> you've had enough it takes a while to get back into to en enjoying these these things uh, quite often um, which we're supposed to but I think with music not but I think quite a lot of the the experience of the live music event is not necessarily quite what the research is about occasionally I find myself kind of looking at a space and thinking about how people are interacting and quite often taking photos because I think it might make a good book cover uh, or something like that. The, the venue stories one was a snap I took at uh, a mission gig in, in York. Uh, just happened to look all right for that, that book. Um, uh, although Julia takes photos far better than I do, so <laughs> there's always a, a rich source of material there as well. But no, it, it doesn't in the same way, I think, uh, because I don't think it's the... I think it's partly because it's not the sort, quite the, resource, the source of research, and also I think you get lost in the moment in a way that you don't necessarily with, with other, other forms uh, at all. But I think the passion for it is partly because, for various reasons, I didn't go and see live music for a long time, and, and it was reigniting a passion. Uh, and, and then, you know, in, in looking for areas to research or building on other areas for research, finding that thing both that I was passionate about and finding that other people were passionate about it as well against that collaborative moment, that, that's what made we want to do it. And I think a lot of the time that's the, that's the best research. It's something we really want to do. Uh, it's something we're really interested in and we can maintain an interest in, which is one of the reasons why I can't drop some of the areas for research because I'm interested in all those things, not one or one or the other, which can make it difficult sometimes. I think that might answer the question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, one at the back. It, that is, that's a really in interesting question and um, I think a really complicated one. So thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think okay, I think it, what so I think what creative writers have always done is, is engage with other subject areas. So I think it, it is inevitably part of of the discipline. You know, you do need to research in whatever field you're you're writing about in some form or another. So it's partly there al already, but I think it's. I think one of the things that's fundamental about always being recognised is about the importance of, of, of narratives, about storytelling across a range of, of different disciplines, and about in particular disciplines how engaging with people in writing, creating, recounting narratives feeds back into uh, a whole range of uh, other different disciplines and, and practices. Um, so again, the, the one that only in the last week I've been talking to, to Brendan in the business school about is something they've been working on where they, they want to talk to people about their experiences of tourism in York and how that can impact on the local economy. We've been doing stuff around music venues and the local economy and capturing people's narratives. Actually, these two things are already really, really close. So we put them together and, and, and we see what comes out of that. So it's in that kind of a collaborative moment. Um, and, and uh, again, as an example, Abby's project to watch out for, because it's absolutely fantastic, around um, creative writing and parenthood uh, is another fabulous e example of that. The Terra 2 project, which I've had the, the good fortune to work on with, with Liesl, has gone out into communities working with scientists, working with religious groups, 
getting people to use narratives to talk about philosophical or scientific concerns as a way of exploring and, if you like, creatively playing with those ideas in, in, in a safe way to see what the results might be, amongst other things. So I think there's a whole series of, of applications that require and need the skills of the creative writer, creative person, as if those disciplines weren't creative in their own way. They all are, but it's, it's the expression of it through creative writing that's, that's significant. Okay. Question over here. One, two, three, yes. Uh, so, I'm, Rob's my main supervisor for the PhD that I'm doing. Single-handedly, Rob is the person why I'm doing the PhD at, at uh, York St. John, because uh, I sent to a few places, and I think I sent Rob an email on, uh, I think it was a Friday night, about half past six, not expecting anybody to be, to answer it, and he answered me three times. Uh, and we spoke about four or five times over the weekend. And he gave me more feedback than my own supervisor at the pro previous university doing a master's had done all summer doing that. And so the question is this, because you, you, you do so much, you've got so many fingers and pies, but what I did, what I'm doing is sort of off the spectrum of everything that you're doing. But when you enthused about, you were so enthusiastic and so... So the question is, what motivates you to just be this dynamo that you are? What's, what's, the, what's the rocket fuel that you power yourself on? Um, <clears throat> it, it was during lockdown. I, that's <laughs> that's one, one of the reasons why I answered quite so quickly. But no, no, it was. Um, no, I, th I, think, and I think there are some really interesting similarities with your project about memory in the past and the relationship between between fact and fiction, which, which, which do connect really, really interestingly. I don't know. It's, I don't know. I, I just, Sorry, you're you so full of humility, and you're thanking everybody. I mean, I, I could, could thank you a million times for yeah. everything you've done for me, the patience that you've had when I've gone out there. You're just such a kind and kind uh, uh, that's, that's very nice to hear, uh, and uh, <laughs> back at you. Um, <laughs> But it's, um, but, but I, I, again, it's, it's the ideas, isn't it? And I think that's one of the, the great joys of working in, in education, in higher education, is, the, is that you get to work with people who have interesting, exciting ideas, undergraduate students, postgraduate students, colleagues, everybody. And it's one of the, the things that makes the job a real a real privilege to be able to get excited about people's ideas and work with them and to be inspired by, by people as, uh, as well. So I think that that's really where, f for me, it comes from. It is from, from other people. Thank you. We might just squeeze one more in. So just one last question, Adam. Thank you. I mean, just answer that last question on your behalf as someone who works with you and collaborates with you often. <laughs> Somebody once said to me, the thing about Robert Edgar is he always seems to be in really complicated, stressful situations that would crush a normal person, but he finds it terribly amusing. <laughs> 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 Which actually does connect with what I was going to ask. Um, the, you had a quotation, I think it was from the Thomas Hardy folk horror book. Uh, that said the folk horror returned through parody. Yes. Um, and I just wonder what the role of comedy is in, in all of this nostalgia and hauntology. Because actually, you're, when you engage in these things, it's, it's really fraught and sad, isn't it? It's something that can't be retrieved. There's so many like Bob Fisher and Scarfolk, they're all they're like comic modes, aren't they? It's engaging with the past, making it bearable through comedy. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about the function of comedy in this. Well, I think, I think a lot of folk horror, and Keith and I were chatting about this not that long ago, a lot of folk horror is, horror is deeply comic as well. There is something intrinsically ludicrous in uh, Christopher Lee dancing about behind him, as well as the horror of, the, of, of, of what Edward Woodward's going to face, Neil Howey's going to face in that environment. So now I think these are, are, there are deep and dark comic moments throughout these things, otherwise they'd be too bleak. Uh, to bear. There are some examples of folk horror where you don't get that, where it is purely, uh, purely horrific or unsettling or disturbing. Uh, and uh, as an aside, I think that's one of the reasons why short fiction 
or folk horror lends itself to short fiction so well because we can kind of maintain that horror for only so long before it becomes really quite quite unbearable. But a lot of The Wicker Man is absolutely hilarious and I think it is intentionally um, so. So I, I, think, I think there is a darkness, uh, a darkness to it. I think one of the reasons why you get things like The League of Gentlemen and, and aspects of other kind of popular British comedy, Reeves and Mortimer do it a lot in the 90s, is that there's a kind of a, a, a generation who grew up with it, kind of playing it back. So they're replicating what went before. As it gets towards 2010 and, and further in there, it starts to become darker, it starts to become a lot bleaker as people, I suppose people like Ben Wheatley and Andrew Michael Hurley, amongst others, start to find their own voice and start to find new folk horror narratives. So it doesn't lose its, 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 uh, its starting point, but it does start to become darker. But I think it starts to take a more political edge and it reflects something slightly more unsettling. But there's still plenty of, of, of dark folk horror or hauntological infused moments. As you know, the the, um, the alderman in Bob Mortimer's Athletico Mint is a great example of that. It's so if anyone hasn't heard, it's worth listening to that podcast. It's so horrifically disturbing and hilarious in equal measure. Excellent, thank you. I'm struck in those com those questions by two things. Firstly, that we all want to have further conversations with you, Rob, and there'll be a chance to do that very shortly. But secondly, that a lot of those questions also wanted to show our appreciation for Rob as well. So I'm going to invite you all to do that whilst I just nip off, off the stage for a second to grab a gift for Rob. So would you join me in applauding what was a fantastic lecture? Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.